Uh, so what do, you, what do you study exactly and why? So I am an applied economist and a behavioral economist. And I am particularly interested in, uh, in integrating insights and data from the biological sciences and from genetics into economics. And in this interview, I'd like to talk principally about my work in genoeconomics. Um, so genoeconomics, as the name suggests, uh, is, an, is a field at the intersection of economics and genetics. Uh, it's an emerging new field, but it's growing very rapidly. And I would define it as follows. So there's, I, I would say there's two main components to it. Um, the first component um, is about trying to find genetic variants that are associated with behavioral phenotypes. Um, so when I say a phenotype, uh, I talk about what I mean is a trait or an outcome. A phenotype is just another word for it that we use typically in genetics. Uh, and examples of behavioral phenotypes we're interested in include economic preferences, such as risk and time preferences, social preferences, um, educational attainment, income, personality, and so on. So this is really uh, the genetics of behavioral phenotypes. So trying to find the genetic variants that are associated with those, those phenotypes. And you can also call that social genomics. Um, but as an economist, I, I focus more on economic phenotypes. And um, there's a strong parallel with uh, medical genetics in which uh, researchers try to find genetic variants associated with, um, with medical phenotypes. Um, so what we're doing is, is very similar, except we're trying to uh, find genetic variants associated with, um, with behavioral or economic phenotypes. So that's the first component. And the second component of genoeconomics is really just to use the resulting findings uh, to study questions of interest to economists and, so, and social scientists. Perfect. That's great. So, um, so how, did, how, does gen, how does genetics affect economics and vice versa? So in the first place, uh, many behavioral and economic phenotypes matter a great deal uh, for the economy. So if we think of phenotypes such as educational attainment, risk and time preferences, which are a crucial input into macroeconomic models, um, so those, those traits or phenotype are very important uh, for the economy. Um, and most, if not all, of these phenotypes are under strong genetic influence. Uh, and there's a sizable literature documenting that. Uh, so to understand uh, these phenotypes, uh, it's important to understand the genetics as well. So as such, economists uh, should be interested in the genetics of these traits in the first place. Uh, in addition, let me spell out a few other reasons why I think economists should care about genetics. Um, so first, uh, in, the near in the near term uh, or the near future, um, it will be a very rich source of data for applied economics. Um, so more and more uh, microeconomic and socioeconomic data sets include genotypic data now. Um, and it it's possible to build predicting predictor variables based on genetic, genotypic data, based on number of traits, pretty much any traits for which uh, massive genetic studies have been performed. It's not possible to build predicting variables based on genetic data to predict those traits. Um, so, and the predictive powers of these polygenic scores will increase dramatically over the coming years uh, as we discover more and more of the underlying genetic variants. Uh, so as such, genoeconomics will be a very rich source of data for applied economists. Um, second, uh, it would be possible to better understand the biological mechanism underlying various phenotypes, and this can lead to better economic models, and as such, genetic economics can be complementary with neuroeconomics. neuroeconomics. Um, as well, we can get a better understanding of interactions between gene and economic and social environment, and this can lead to targeted policy interventions. Uh, so just as there is personalized medicine, or at least there's a lot of talk about personalized medicine, we can think in the future of, um, of personalized policy intervention where um, people, for instance, who are, who are at risk uh, for certain outcomes may be uh, helped through uh, various interventions, of course, with their informed consent. Um, and as well, there'll be um, lots of empirical, of other empirical implication in general from gene economics. So for instance, it will be possible to use genes as intr instrumental variables um, of course, we have to make sure that the exclusion restriction hold, uh, as always, for this type of uh, for instrumental variables. And lastly, I think it's just intrinsically very interesting to study. Yeah, very cool. Um, so what can you tell us about existing studies on genetics um, in social sciences? 
So it's important to distinguish between two different types of studies on the genetics of social sciences, or rather genetics of social traits or behavioral traits. Um, the first type of studies um, aims to disentangle genetic and environmental and familial influences on, on those social or behavioral traits or phenotypes. Um, so there's a sizable literature in both economics and in a field called behavioral genetics that aims to estimate the irritability of economic and, and uh, behavioral phenotypes. Um, and the irritability of a trait is defined as the fraction of the variance of the trait that is attributable to genetic factors. Um, and there's two main methods that are classically used to estimate irritability. Uh, the first method is based on twin studies, where you compare the resemblance between monozygotic and dizygotic twins. And the second method is based on adoption studies. Uh, and the conclusion for the vast majority from, for, from these studies is that for the vast majority of behavioral phenotypes, um, that they are both under genetic and environmental and familial influence. Um, and this may come, this may be obvious to some um, in a sense that both genes and environment matters for behavioral phenotypes. Um, but actually, there was a huge debate on this in the, a few decades ago. Um, and many still are under the impression that only medical and physical phenotypes are genetically influenced, but that behavioral phenotypes are in a separate category and that genes don't matter for them. Um, but in reality, behavioral phenotypes are also genetically influenced. Uh, so it makes sense. So the, the point here is that it makes sense to look for genetic variants associated with behavioral phenotypes because they aren't in part under genetic influence. Um, and in fact, the, uh, for most behavioral phenotypes, the irritability is around 0 0.2 to 0 0.5. Um, so 20 to 50 percent of the variation is attributable to genetic factors, typically. Um, so the second main type of um, of, of studies is um, molecular is based on molecular genetics and economics, and this is what I was talking earlier. What I'm working mostly on these days, and it, the idea is to search for genetic variants that are associated with various phenotypes. Um, and on that front, much less is known. Uh, it's still a very young discipline, and um, and it's, it's emerging and growing very rapidly. But at this point, we still have a lot to learn. Uh, and the research group, um, the research group I'm working on, um, I'm working with, has so far discovered 74 genetic variants associated with, associated with educational attainment, and also we can construct predictor predictor scores uh, with genetic data that explains about three percent of the variance in educational attainment. Um, but apart from that, the field as a whole has a lot of false positive results that fail to replicate, and we haven't found that many other genetic variants robustly associated with behavioral phenotypes yet. Um, this is about to change very soon, in my opinion. A crucial issue here is, all, is statistical power, because many of these genetic variants have very small effect sizes, so it's very important to have very large samples to be able to detect them. Yeah, yeah. Um... So you mentioned that it's a it's a young field. Um, so where do you think it's headed? Well, I think in the in the coming years, I anticipate very very rapid progress uh, and very and major discoveries uh, in molecular genetics and economics and molecular genetics and social social sciences generally, as very very large samples um, with genetic data become available. Uh, so in particular, the UK Biobank. Uh, is becoming completely available, the, the, the entire data set, uh, at some point in 2016, with 500,000 people who have been genotyped. Um, so the next major step in this field is really simply to obtain and analyze larger and larger samples, uh, and to analyze them for more and more phenotypes and discover more and more genetic variants. And then also to understand the biology uh, of these genetic variants and understand the genetic architecture of the phenotypes. Um, so I think that's the next major step for genome economics is really, and I think there, there's, it's going to keep us busy for, from, for a few years and anticipate lots of, um, lots of discoveries. Uh, but then in parallel, there'll be lots of applications for economists. Um, so the predictive power of polygenic score for behavioral traits will rise substantially over the coming years, I anticipate, and this will lead to major, uh, to many empirical applications. Um, as well, new findings will, um, open up new areas of research, such as gene-environment interaction, targeted policy interventions that I was mentioning earlier. And this can also help us understand the biology. Um, so I think that's where the field is headed. Yeah, it sounds pretty exciting. 
Um, what are, what are, you mentioned some policy implications for your work already, but um, can you expand on that? Absolutely, absolutely. This is a very good question. Um, so first, let me step back. Um, when talking about policy in this work, I, I like to step back and emphasize two important points uh, that are important to keep in mind when thinking about findings from genome economics. Um, so in the late 70s, um, when the first estimates of the irritability um, were obtained for several behavioral traits, such as income, for instance, uh, there were debates that were raging about the implications for policy. And some researchers at first thought that the fact uh, that genes influence income or education uh, means that nothing can be done about these. Um, and this led Archer Goldberger, who, uh, who's an economist, who was an economist, um, to formulate what is now known as the Goldberger critique, which is basically the idea that the extent to which a trait is genetically influenced is often irrelevant to evaluate the possibility that public policy, public policy may ameliorate the trait. And the famous example that Goldberger used was the eyeglass example. Uh, that's the idea that like eyesight or myopia, for instance, is highly irritable, but still it's possible to ameliorate the trait through eyeglasses or contact lenses. Um, so the main point is that the fact that a trait is genetically influenced doesn't mean that it's, um, it's impossible to, um, to, uh, for policy to ameliorate it. Another important point is what is now known as the Jenks critique. Um, and the idea is that for many behavioral phenotypes, genes act partly by influencing the environment individuals decide to be exposed to. So an example I like to use is that good hockey players may be good because they love to play hockey and they practice more often. So maybe they have a gene that makes them love hockey. Actually, they probably have many genes. They have a combination of genetic variants that make them love hockey. And as a result of that, they practice more and they become good at hockey. Because, of course, this is an hypothetical example. I'm not saying that's the case. But for many phenotypes, especially behavioral phenotypes, uh, the genes act via the environment that the individuals decide to be exposed to. And we talk now about, often we talk about nature, nature via nurture, as opposed to nature versus nurture. Uh, so in terms of policy implications, uh, to get back to your original questions, keeping in mind these two, these two caveats, um, I think a lot will come from, uh, from simply better understanding how genes and environment interact. Um, so this will, first of all, allow us to better understand the development of various traits and phenotypes of interest. Um, and then we can also imagine not the distant future, uh, targeted policy intervention, as I mentioned earlier, a bit like there, we can imagine uh, personalized medicine. Uh, so for instance, youth that are in unfavorable environments and have a specific genotype that makes them vulnerable to uh, some environment, uh, it may be possible to... Um, to target policy interventions that may help them, of course, uh, with the informed consent of the, um, the responsible person for this. But, um, but I do see um, anticipate policy implication in this, in this direction in the future. Yeah, definitely. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so again, this is a fairly young field, and I'm sure that there are a lot of, uh, a lot of young scholars who are interested in it. Um, so what are the skills they need to, to do this kind of work and to make some, some big strides in it? So as you said, this is, this is a very young discipline, uh, and there are, no, or there are very few formal courses uh, that exist for genome economics. Um, so the first thing one needs to succeed is to be able to self-teach and to self-learn. Um, so it's important to be able to read papers on your own, to learn techniques, new techniques, and for this you really need curiosity and interest. Um, as well, there's a lot of statistics and econometrics involved in analyzing the data, so it helps to have goods and statistics and econometric skills. Um, and last but not least, it's very important to just be ready to uh, get your hands dirty, so to speak, and learn new statistical package, work with the data, think creatively about the problems we encounter. Um, it's hard to describe in detail, uh, to describe this in detail, but we keep learning new things, we keep encountering new challenges. Uh, so one needs to be ready to uh, to work and have a practical bent, practical bent, and just be willing to uh, roll up one sleeve and um, and solve problems, uh, empir empirical problems. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm sure this is not an extensive list of all the things that you want to say, but is there is there anything I might have missed or that you'd like to add? 
Ah, uh, yes, there's only one thing I'd like to add, and it's that I'm very happy to be working in this field this time. Um, it's, it's just very fascinating. I'm discussing, learning new things every day and anticipate also that it will very heavily impact empirical research and economics in the, in the social sciences um, in the coming decades. Um, and as I said earlier, I think we're on the cusp of a, an explosion of discoveries in gene economics as larger and larger sample sizes are becoming available. So this is the right time to get involved uh, in this field. And I, I'm fortunate to be able to, uh, to do research on this. Cool. Um, okay, one last question. Uh, yeah. How did you get in? Like, how did you decide to do this? I mean, you're you're an economist, so like, yeah. what what pushed you in this direction? Yeah. So, um, I I started working with David Lapson at Harvard uh, during my PhD on behavioral economics, and um, and then I uh, there was this opportunity to do a project in neuroeconomics at Princeton University. So I visited. Um, a lab, neuroscience lab at Princeton for, for five months, the third year of my PhD. And so I got really interested in biology and economics, broadly speaking. And at the same time, there was a, a friend of mine, David Cesarini at MIT, who was also very interested in genoeconomic and genetics. And um, so essentially, I got exposure to neuroeconomics, biology, and economics, and then we uh, got access to a great data set uh, in genetics and economics. Um, to do some research, and that's how that's essentially how I got in in the first place.